I was walking on the market one day with my wife, and somebody stuck a cage in my face, and between those slits were the saddest eyes I've ever seen. And there was a very sick orangutan baby, my first encounter. That evening, I came back to the market in the dark, and I heard, <coughs> and sure enough, I found a dying orangutan baby on a garbage heap. Of course, the cage was salvaged. I took up the little baby, massaged her, forced her to drink until she finally started breathing normally. This is Uche. She is now living in the jungle of Sungai Wain. And this is Matahari, her second son, which, by the way, is also the son of the second orangutan I rescued, Dodoi. That changed my life quite dramatically. And as of today, I have almost 1,000 orangutan babies in my two centers, which is no, 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 wrong. It's horrible. It's a proof of our failing to save them in the wild. It's not good. This is merely proof of everyone failing to do the right thing, having more than all the orangutans and all the zoos in the world together, just now like victims for every baby, six having disappeared from the forest. The deforestation, especially for oil palm, to provide biofuel for the Western countries is what's causing these problems. And those are the peat swamp forests on 20 meters of peat, the largest accumulation of organic material in the world. When you open this for growing oil palms, you're creating CO2 volcanoes that are emitting so much CO2 that my country is now the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world after China and the United States. And we don't have any industry at all, only because of this deforestation. And these are horrible images. I'm not going to talk too long about it. But there are so many of the family of Uche which are not so fortunate to live out there in that forest that still have to go through that process. And I don't know anymore where to put them. So I decided I had to come up with a solution for her, but also a solution that will benefit the people that are trying to exploit those forests to get their hands on the last timber and that are causing, in that way, the loss of habitat and all those victims. So I created a place, Sambocha Lestari, and the idea was, if I can do this on the worst possible place that I can think of, where there is really nothing left, no one will have an excuse to say, yeah, but, no. Everyone should be able to follow this. So we're in East Borneo, and this is the place up there where I started. As you can see, there is only yellow terrain. There's nothing left, just a bit of grass there. In 2002, we had about 50% of the people jobless there. There was a huge amount of crime. People spent so much of their money on health uh, issues and on drinking water. There was no agricultural productivity left. This was the poorest district in the whole province. And it was a total extinction of wildlife. This was like a biological desert. When I stood there in the grass, it's hot, not even the sound of insects, just this waving grass. Still, four years later, we have created jobs for about 3,000 people. The climate has changed. I will show you. The climate has changed. No more flooding, no more fires. It's no longer the poorest district. And there is a huge development of biodiversity. We've got over 1,000 tree species. We have 137 bird species as of today. We have 30 species of reptiles. So what happened here? And we created a huge economic value in this forest. So basically, the whole process of destruction had gone a bit slower than what is happening now with the oil palm. But we saw the same thing. We had slash and burn agriculture. People cannot afford to fertilize, so they burn the trees and have the minerals available there. The fires become more frequent. And after a while, you're stuck with an area of land where there is no fertility left, there is no trees left. Still, in this place, in this grassland, where you see our very first office there on that hill, four years later, there's this one green blob on the Earth's surface. And there's all these animals, and there's all these people happy, and there's this economic value. So how is this possible? It was quite simple. If you look at the steps, we bought the land, we dealt with the fire, and then only we started doing the reforestation by combining agriculture with forestry. Only then we set up the infrastructure and management and the monitoring, but we made sure that in every step of the way, the local people were going to be fully involved so that no 
outside forces would be able to interfere with that, that the people would become the defenders of that forest. So we do the people, profit, planet principles, but to it in addition, a sure legal status, because if the forest belongs to the state, people say it belongs to me, it belongs to everyone. And then we apply all these other principles like transparency, professional management, measurable results, scalability, replicability, etc. What we did was we formulated recipes, how to go from a starting situation where you have nothing to a target situation. And you formulate a recipe based upon the factors that you can control, whether it be the skills or the fertilizer or the plant choice. And then you look at the outputs and you start measuring what is coming out. Now, in this recipe, you have also the cost. You also know how much labor is needed. If you can drop this recipe on the map, on a sandy soil, on a clayey soil, on a steep slope, on a flat soil, you put those different recipes. If you combine them, out of that comes a business plan, comes a work plan, and you can optimize it for the amount of labor that you have available or for the amount of fertilizer you have, and you can do it. This is how it in practice looks like. We have this grass that we want to get rid of. It exudes cyankali-like compounds from the roots. But the acacia trees have very low value, but we need them to restore the microclimate, to protect the soil, and to shade out the grasses. And after eight years, they might actually yield some timber, that is, if you can preserve it in a right way, which we can do with the peels of bamboo. It's an old temple building technique from Japan, but bamboo is very fire susceptible. So if we would plant that in the beginning, we would have a very high risk of losing everything again. So we planted later along the waterways to filter the water, provide the raw products, just in time when the timber becomes available. So the idea is how to integrate these flows in space, over time, and with the limited means you have. So we plant the trees, we plant these pineapples and beans and gingers in between to reduce the competition for the trees, the crop fertilizer, organic material is useful for the agricultural crops for the people, but also helps the trees, the farmers have free land, the system yields early income, the orangutans get healthy food, and we can speed up ecosystem regeneration while even saving some money. So beautiful, what a theory, but is it really that easy? Not really, because if you look what happened in 1998, the fire started. This is an area of about 50 million hectares. January, February, March, April, May. We lost 5.5 million hectares in just a matter of a few months. And this is because we have 10,000s of those underground fires that you also have in Pennsylvania here in the United States. And once the soil gets dry during a dry season, you get cracks, oxygen goes in, flames comes out, and the problem starts all over again. So how to break that cycle? Fire is the biggest problem. This is what it looked like for three months. For three months, the automatic lights outside did not go off because it was that dark. We lost all the crops. No children gained weight for over a year. They lost 12 IQ points. It was a disaster for orangutans and people. So these fires are really the first thing to work on. That was why I put it as a single point up there. And you need the local people for that, because these grasslands, once they start burning, it goes through it like a windstorm. And you lose, again, the last bit of ash and nutrients with the first rainfall going to the sea, killing off the coral reefs there. So you have to do it with the local people. That is the short-term solution, but you also need a long-term solution. So what we did is we created a ring of sugar palms around the area. These sugar palms turn out to be fire resistant, also flood resistant, by the way, and they provide a lot of income for local people. This is how it looks like. The people have to tap them twice a day, just a millimeter of slice, and the only thing you harvest is sugar water, carbon dioxide, rainfall, and a little bit of sunshine. In principle, you make those trees into biological photovoltaic cells. And you can create so much energy from this because they produce three times more energy per hectare per year because you can tap them on a daily basis. You don't need to harvest organs than any other of the crops. So this is the combination where we have all this genetic potential in the tropics, which is still unexploited, and doing it in combination with technology, but also your legal side needs to be in very good order. So we bought that land, and here is 